This week we're looking at footage from the Red Epic W, which can film in 8K and ends up costing about $50,000 for a ready to shoot package. We'll be comparing it with a six year old DSLR and some basic stuff from around the house, including some string instead of a tripod. Total cost around 500 bucks. So before we get into the footage, I think it's important to remember that while it's fairly easy to objectively measure the quality of a camera, it's much harder to be objective and rational about what we actually need. I don't know about you, but as soon as I start window shopping for cameras, suddenly all logic goes out the window and suddenly I'm convincing myself that I do need all of the best features, regardless of how often I'd actually use them and how many years of my life I'd have to spend working to pay off that purchase. And that's why I'm doing this test, so we can strip everything back to a basic DIY and then compare that to a high-end cinema package. So most of us will probably be in the middle somewhere, and I feel like this is the best way to find out where on that spectrum from cheap to expensive we are gonna sit. And maybe we can even expose some misconceptions about expensive cameras. So after shooting with a couple of pro cameras alongside my DSLR, I've noticed that the biggest difference is detail and sharpness. It's hardly surprising, but the DSLR with a cheap lens is much softer than the 8K monster with a $6,000 lens. Now this level of detail from the red helium sensor is very rarely needed outside of huge VFX heavy films like Guardians of the Galaxy 2, where there was lots of green screen, so they wanted the most detail possible for keying out hair, for example. The vast majority of films in cinemas now are not filmed in 8K, and that's not just because it's new technology. A lot of the best DPs actually find that even 4K is too sharp, and they end up using diffusion filters to soften the image down. So clearly for me, it's not worth spending all that money on 8K, and even as a rental, because of the huge extra cost in hard drives to store those massive files. But of course, I do agree that the DSLR is soft, and that's why I normally use better lenses, and I can understand why someone would spend a bit more on a camera if sharpness is a priority. Now around this time, someone usually points out that with 4K or higher, you actually get extra benefits because you can scale up the footage on a smaller timeline, like how you can reframe any shot by cropping in and it'll still have plenty of detail thanks to those extra pixels. And that is a nice convenience to have, but for me personally, I find that when I know I can reframe later, I actually get a bit lazy with my composition and end up with problems that can't be solved by cropping in. The costs outweigh the benefits when I consider how much I'd actually use cropping. But then people say, what about stabilizing and faking camera movements? But that's really not as good as it sounds. Watch this, this is what happens when you simulate a dolly move on high res footage. It doesn't feel like the camera is moving. Really we're simulating a zoom because there's no change in perspective. Real movement looks like this. You can see the parallaxing makes it three dimensional while the digital cropping stays flat. It's a two dimensional move. And it's the same whether you're going in or out, side to side, it's very clear that the camera isn't actually moving. And of course that goes the other way too. If you're trying to remove real three-dimensional movement, like camera shake, then there's always gonna be some warping when you digitally stabilize the 2D image. So yes, you can crop in and the image remains sharp, but in my mind, it's miles away from replacing sliders or steady cams. Of course, it'd be nice to have cropping as an option, but I'm not gonna spend lots of extra money for something that I would use very rarely. Okay, so that is more than enough talk about sharpness. Let's look at dynamic range, which I used to think was the most important feature on a camera. Now, the first thing to consider is that we're only gonna see strong differences in fairly extreme lighting situations. So here, when direct sunlight shines inside, you can see the red rolls off the highlights smoothly, but the DSLR just jumps to complete white, which doesn't look nearly as good or true to life. However, in this shot, the lighting isn't so extreme now that we're barely showing the window, so both cameras can handle the highlights and shadows. And honestly, it's very possible to stay within the range of the DSLR. Here's example footage where the DSLR could totally handle the lighting, and if you know how to set up your own lights, then the dynamic range problems basically disappear. On the whole, I was surprised by how similar the shots looked. And I'm not doing anything fancy with the DSLR, it's all natural light, 
but if you are interested in the setup, I'll leave a link to the last video, which goes into more detail about the DIY side of things. In a fairly tough lighting situation like this, the DSLR was struggling, but I was able to drop the exposure down on the lens and then later brighten the footage in post, which obviously isn't ideal, but in this case worked out fairly well, I reckon. But here's the thing I never realized until I actually shot with these cameras. Just because you record the highlight detail doesn't mean you can actually use it. Take a look at this from the red, which was shot in raw so we can actually go in and drop the exposure until the window is correctly exposed. Pretty cool, right? But we're not going to be able to see the rest of the image unless A, we increase the exposure on the entire image, which obviously will brighten the window again, or B, we could just bring the shadows up which ends up looking really weird and low contrasty. Or C, we could actually mask out the brightest parts of the frame and darken those individually. We could do that, but as well as it being really time consuming to mask out every single frame, it ends up looking really odd and fake because the windows are actually supposed to be bright. That's what's illuminating our characters. The point is just because cameras shooting raw can handle any crazy lighting you throw at it, that doesn't mean that it will actually look good after color correction. And so we end up needing to pay attention to our lighting just like with cheaper cameras. Right, this video is getting long, so let's rocket through these last parts. In low light, obviously the red is better and there's not too much else to say about that. For a lot of people, it's really important to be able to shoot at high ISOs. But for me at least, I've noticed that lighting gear doesn't have to be that expensive and it does a lot more than just brightening the image so you can use a lower ISO. It actually gives you so much more control over the entire image. Slow motion. This is one of the main things you're paying for with high-end cameras. The RED can shoot 120 frames a second in 4K, whereas the DSLR can only do 60 frames a second in 720p. Obviously a big difference there, I can totally understand why someone would pay more for those higher frame rates. But for me personally, I think slow motion is kind of overused mostly. Like when I think of my favorite films, very few of them have much slow motion in them. I can always rent a more expensive camera when the project comes along that really calls for slow motion. So I'm not gonna let that influence me into spending loads and loads on an everyday camera. And by the way, big thanks to Panny Hire who provided the equipment rental for the day. They obviously haven't paid me or told me what to say in this video. They just helped out with the gear. Now let's talk about RAW. Again, it's probably overkill for sub $1 million projects. You've got expensive cards, the extra hard drive space, the processing time, it's usually not worth it when you can just get your camera settings right on set. And for me personally, I find it hard to tell the difference between raw video and say progress. I'm not saying it's a waste of money, but clearly this camera is not designed for me and the stuff I shoot. Size. This one is pretty straightforward. One of these cameras is a lot smaller and lighter than the other which means it can fit in more spaces and can be used with smaller, cheaper tripods, sliders, and gimbals. The small size and general lack of professional appearance also helps when you're filming in public spaces, a lot less likely to get kicked out or hassled. I do have to say it's nice to have such a large display on the red and everything is nicely laid out, whereas on the DSLR, it can be a bit fiddly. And last of all, price. The DSLR is so much cheaper which does free up money to spend on actors, locations, hiring crew. For me personally, I definitely sit towards the cheaper end of the spectrum from DIY DSLR to expensive RED shooting in 8K. And of course, there are many different options for in-between cameras that aren't so expensive, but do still excel in a few areas, depending on what you need as a shooter. Right now, the only way that I could imagine shooting on such an expensive camera would be using a very short-term rental and only if I could really justify the value of 8K or the slow motion, which seems kind of unlikely. But one day, if I have the budget to hire a crew of 50 people and build sets from scratch and work with well-known actors, then sure, I would go for a high-end camera because it would be a tiny proportion of the budget. But that's not my situation. And you know, if I'm asking my actors to work for barely minimum wage, and the sound recordist is doing three people's jobs at the same time, and the cast are wearing their own clothes instead of real costumes, then that better be down to a real lack of money. And not just that we couldn't afford those things because we've blown 60% of the budget on a nicer camera. That's my view. My name's Simon Cade, this has been DSLR Guide, and I'll see you next week.